So welcome, everybody. Uh, there's a nice quorum here today. Nice to see everybody. My name's Duncan Nichols, and I'm from Thetford, Vermont. And um, most of us, I think, are from this area. But is anyone here from a distance? They want to just raise their hand. They've driven from a, a distance. Oh, Henry, yeah, and Jerome. Uh, so I'm not the MC, but I just want to uh, let people know that two things. One is that we're going to send out tonight, before August 6th is done and Hiroshima Day is officially done, we're going to send out an online petition to ask Becca Ballant to sign some legislation that is in the House right now. And so we'll, everyone here should get that, particularly because Nancy may be sending out a clipboard with, to get your email address and name on, and she could send that around any time. But we're going to send around that same petition, which is about a bill called uh, House Resolution 77. That's the Christian name. Maybe that's uh, not just a Christian name, but... That's its name, is H.R. 77, but it's based on back from the brink's work um, with the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. But there's a lot of things in that bill, whereas is that talk about the dangers of nuclear weapons, meaning the hair trigger alert system that everything is on now, the, the fact that one person can press the button, they try to change that. There's certain key factors that have been thought through that can reduce the dangers. So we're, I think we're all feeling anxious. So tonight you will get a, an online petition in your email and other, a lot of other people that shows a lot of F-35s lined up on an aircraft carrier. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice if we could change those F-35s to, what are they called? What do you call them? The cranes. The peace cranes. The peace crane, and I think that's a Japanese Invent invention, and maybe this technology is Japanese, too. <laughs> so I won't say anything more about this resolution. And it's in the House now that we're going to ask Becca Ballant to become a co-sponsor of. But I will say that we're going to read uh, from some of the essential language of that in a little while outside on, on the, near the steps of the, the um, city hall here in Burlington. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say. So I'm passing around. There are two clipboards going around. Maybe one can go there, and I'll send the other one this way. And what it is, it's, it's if you're not on our email list, then sign the petition if you want to. And the language to the petition is underneath the petition, because it's a letter that we're writing to Becca Ballant, an open letter. So that's that. Yeah. Your okay. Email. Oops. Robin, we're all set. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Here we are. Um, so welcome everyone, my name's Robin Lloyd. I'd like to uh, just explain why I've been so committed to trying to abolish nuclear weapons for decades now. And it happened because I went to Hiroshima in uh, 1985, which was the 40th anniversary of uh, the dropping of the bomb. And there was something there called the A&H Bomb Conference and called by the Japanese peace movement every year. And when I was there, I met all the people whose lives are affected and diminished by uranium and nuclear weapons. For example, there were people from the Navajo Nation where they mine uranium. There were people from Pantex where nuclear weapons are assembled. That's some place in Texas. 
And of course, there were people there from the Marshall Islands where nuclear bombs are tested. And so people from all these places and countries continue to suffer from nuclear-based illnesses. And they could be called hibakusha, which is the Japanese word for nuclear survivors. So I want to introduce to you on video someone who I've gotten to know very well. Uh, she experienced a nuclear bomb exploding over her head in Hiroshima. Her name is Hideko Tamara. She is 90 years old. She was 10 years old in 1945 when the bomb was dropped, and she presently lives in Oregon. She has been a member of our Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Disarm Committee for the many years, and she spoke recently to us about her concerns. So let's look at a segment of, the, of her talk now. I just wanted to say, from all these years, having uh, participated and planned vigil for Hiroshima and Nagasaki annual remembrance, and uh, this year will be the 79th. My greatest concern right now is there is more likelihood of a possible misuse of the nuclear weapon. And part of the reason is in spite of the participation in the uh, annual remembrance, American people, or well, most of the people, have absolutely no idea what this goddamn thing is like. You know, it, it's a thing, oh, I'm so sorry it happened. No, 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 no. You have got to be a lot more serious and then please learn as much as you can how horrific it is. I think if you have been in a, a war situation, you have a little bit more, you know, and we had carpet bombing, and, you know, that's also a genocide. Uh, long before the uh, nuclear weapons use, I I would love it if you can study more about it or do whatever you can to get the sense of what the use of a nuclear weapon and the people being killed in it. You know, right. I, I'm 90 years old and a half. I'm not going to be around that much longer, probably, you know, although... I'm very uh, in spirit, resilient and, and stubborn. So I'm in spirit, I'll be here forever supporting you. However, this is really a bad time. And we got to be out there very clearly. American people have no idea. The, the thing that bothered us was that we were very coldly experimented on because the, the data about all of us were gathered right away by the military and was suppressed. And then MacArthur took the whole thing out of the town and no one was supposed to talk about it. I mean, the, the whole attempt was planned carefully, militarily, and no wonder this country is the strongest, mightiest military power in the whole goddamn world. So, um, they were the most cruel and in, heard maybe talk. you need oh. to put the words inhumane and cruel in Gloria. <laughs> okay. uh, Although I, yeah. I'm the beneficiary of the most wonderful American people and caring folks, you know, so yeah. it's the human nature, the higher and the lower put together. And I shouldn't really, uh, you know, be surprised about that. Every single one of us has capability for both of this essence in ourselves. I know that very well, but I want you to know nuclear weapon is a consummation of the worst that you could ever have done in this human history. Um, you know, I think it's interesting to know that um, Hideko became a uh, psychotherapist in her life once she came to the United States, and 
there's a longer tape made of her experiences with, uh, she's obviously a Jungian therapist with trying to understand the death wish of uh, the powerful nations to c compile all these uh, nuclear weapons. So, and she said, we must work against war in general because war causes us to want to exterminate our enemy and nuclear weapons are the consummation of the worst thing you can do to your enemy. I think that says very succinctly, explains this disastrous situation we're in with the compiling of nuclear weapons by all of the, I believe it's nine nuclear nations. So she ends, we must avoid war and instead negotiate to end conflicts. Okay, now I'd like to turn to Jim Geyer, who has produced this amazing dot chart, which was made in 1983, 85. And please explain to people what that is. Yeah, first, first I want to start with, by the way, Robin said that she started this work in 1984 or 5, but I know that she was doing it before I was, and I started in 1980, so. Uh -huh. um, but before 1980, the Japanese were, the, before 1980, the Japanese were commemorating Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and they often did it with these floats. Uh, so this is a float and a lantern. And, and it's for the water, and we're going to be putting these on the water tonight down at Perkins Pier, just in case anybody wants to come and be involved. Bring your boat. Robin has a lot of boats. And uh, you, there's a lantern, you know, a little candle in one, in each one. And uh, you've got to have a string on it or else it'll get lost. Uh, and that's, that's going to be for tonight at Perkins Pier about what time? Uh, 6.30. 6.30. My partner Gene and I made that last night, and it was a lot of fun to make. Uh -huh. um, so now I want to talk about this chart. Um, how can I do this and be heard? I, you can take the mic. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, sure. The, the whole yeah. So in um, 1980, I went to a uh, presentation by Helen Caldicott at the IRL and Chapel in, uh, at UVM. And uh, she was talking about, the, it was the Aiken Lecture Series. And the, the topic was nuclear energy. And she, the first thing she said was that, well, nuclear energy is not good, the, these nuclear power plants are not good, but they're a pimple on the pumpkin, is exactly what she said, compared to nuclear weapons. And the place was crowded, full, everything. Everybody was there, I mean, all people, I mean, it was like a whole new crowd. I mean, instantly, you're, you're a part of a new crowd that you're gonna be part of for the rest of your life. And, um, but anyway, people were listening to her message you could hear people crying all throughout the room. It was, it was unbelievable. And um, then, not long after that, Robin organized the die-in on Church Street when Church Street was just being built for the first time, or you know, re remade. And um, that was uh, an opening for me. I mean, I, I did this die-in uh, thing. I laid down in front of what used to be Nectar's, and it was like, uh, putting myself into a new world that never went away. And so that was a fantastic experience that looked like absolutely nothing. And um, I mean, I was just laying down. Um, if you take all the firepower of World War II, you know, 25 countries were involved, 80 million people killed, and put it all together, that's about three megatons of firepower. And that's represented here in the single dot. If you take 
the nuclear weapons that we had in 1980 and put all the megatonnage together, that's 18,000 megatons. You divide the three into 18,000, you get 6,000 World War II. So the, each one of these is equal to a World War II. Another World War II here, here, no matter where you point, another World War II. And that's 6,000 World War II equivalents that were available in nuclear weapons between the United States and the Soviet Union at that time and all the other countries that had them, like France and China. And, uh, um, and there's you know, five, six, seven countries have the, the nuclear weapons right now. Um, now, if you... There's so many ways you can talk about this chart. I mean, you, and which we, I'm not going to do right now. But in uh, after Ray, when Reagan was president, uh, after that, the uh, there were there was the nuclear freeze movement was was going on around the world, and whether exactly how things got to the point where in 1986 they started reducing nuclear weapons. And so the, the, there are not this many, this much firepower right now. Right now, it's about 24 of these squares. So it's right here. So this is the size of what exists right now. All right, right here. So that's, a, that's 24 squares. Each one has 50, 50 World War II equivalents. And that that's, doesn't matter. But the point is, Okay, so we have all of these yet, and it seems like a lot less, it is, but if you take this right down here, eight World War II equivalents in that, that circle, that's equivalent to a Trident sub. Now the Trident sub has, like this, that's, that's our Trident sub. It has 192 bombs on it. They have multiple entry vehicles, five on each on each bomb, on each uh, missile, and they could we <laughs> could carpet bomb the former Soviet Union instantly with with just eight World War II equivalents. Um, and by the way, the Russians now have the, the same capability. They can do it to us, and they could go from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast uh, and uh, totally annihilate us. <clears throat> each, each country could do that with one submarine, and there's, we don't know how many are in the ocean at any time, five or six. There's about 15 of them. They're always remaking them. Um, there's... Uh, Biden is committing more money to a new kind of a nuclear weapon uh, or a new powerful weapon. I don't know, Jim Carrier probably knows the name, but I, I don't know the name of the weapon. But it doesn't matter in some ways because it's just more of the more of the more. So that's, that's all I'm going to say to right now. Uh, when we were working on this and working with the town, the, the idea of the taking the freeze to the town meetings, we had a group and we would meet constantly. And we had what we call a little bit of facts and fears. We would talk about facts and fears. And <clears throat> the facts would be, we were just finding out about these nuclear weapons. This was not in the news. This was not known information. We had to call people like Leahy, our senator, to find out, is this true? And I remember a photograph of a plane in the sky. It was, there was a little, little blurb under this photograph. It was in the free press, and it was a, a plane that's supposed to have had nuclear weapons on it. But we never, that was a, a shock. We never saw things like that. We never heard of things like that. It was, we were in La La Land prior to, to this freeze resolution coming out. Anyway, we had the facts and fears, and we would talk about the facts. Uh, you know, this, this is happening, this is being built, this kind of stuff. And then we talked about the fears, and we found out the fears were not, had nothing to do with being scared, 
scared of being bombed, everybody was scared of talking to their closest relative. Their, their closest, their, their f family, their friends, it's like Thanksgiving, can you imagine talking about this? Well, that's, that's the biggest fear. And that goes around, on around the world, and I do believe that if there's ever a campaign to change things, it's gonna have to be something that, it seems to me, it would have to connect with the climate movement. And, but the main message is talk. I mean, if there was a, all of a sudden a, Oh, uh, crisis, and and do not bother, you know, calling your congressman. That that guy is going to have a lot of calls, or congresswoman, going to have a lot of calls as it is. And but talk to your neighbor, and get that neighbor to talk to other neighbors, and get just talk. That would change the world faster than anything. I I do believe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's put that right there. Okay, um, thank you, Jim. And why does that happen? Oh, it's, yeah. And in fact, uh, tilt that a little bit so it's better for the camera way over there so that uh, as a backdrop, the camera can read all those dots. So um, now I want to introduce. <laughs> Now I want to uh, introduce uh, Henry Nichols, a member of the Next Generation, very active in the uh, Palestinian movement, and uh, I think he will draw some connections between that and the nuclear issues. So please come up. We can just set you up to speak that way. Or do you want to speak from Thank you, Robin. Thanks for putting this together. Um, so, hearing about someone's experience experiencing a nuclear weapon um, is very unusual, and I think in the US, we tend to think of nuclear weapons is not real. And especially growing up myself, thought it was a joke because everyone I knew thought it was a joke and video game and a, you know, a television thing. Um, and for me, I only started to realize the, the reality um, when I learned about the rest of the history of the United States and that made um, the use of World War weapons in World War II make sense because we had um, spent hundreds of years killing indigenous people in this country and with a sense of impunity, um, it was generally our guns and they didn't have guns. and. Uh, there was this, a sense of impunity that lasted for hundreds of years and was related to the European sense of impunity that was spreading across the world. And um, then there was a period where we had conquered all of America and killed the vast majority of indigenous people here. And the choice was, would we continue and go further abroad? And the decision was made, yes. And we went to the Philippines and continued uh, in what many people call um, genocidal colonial war there. And um, there were questions in the US about whether this would continue. There was some debate during that period. Um, and people, American heroes, quote unquote, like Teddy Roosevelt, argued that it was our duty to continue what we had done in this country abroad. Um, and so that, for me, made the use of nuclear weapons in World War II um, make sense as something that was an act of impunity um, and continuing our sense of impunity. And uh, 
and I think that it relates to what we're seeing now, and it relates to the history uh, since World War II, where the U.S. Um, you know, there's reasonable estimates that we killed up to a quarter of the population in North Korea, and that's forgotten. And the Vietnam War in America is thought of a tragedy of 30,000, I think, American soldiers who died, but there was three million Vietnamese who died. And so there's this sense of impunity that, that a tragedy for America is 30,000 soldiers dying. Meanwhile, we don't even know about how many Vietnamese people died here. And I think when it comes to what we're seeing in Gaza and also what we're seeing in the world um, as it relates to the possible use of nuclear weapons today uh, relates to this sense of impunity because especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, that was confirmed. People in this country, uh, especially the ruling class, but to some degree, average people felt that America was entitled to rule the world um, because our greatest rival had fallen and that was evidence. And um, now there are other great powers and the ruling class in this country seems to feel that uh, they have no right to exist as great powers and or even as sovereign countries in some ways. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's only 11 countries in the world that recognize Taiwan as an independent country. The U.S. does not recognize Taiwan as an independent country, and yet we have troops that we put there in the last few years. And so this is a, something that uh, is ratcheting up tensions to a degree that nuclear weapons are, are real again. And what we're seeing in Gaza is also this kind of complete impunity and genocidal action which comes with this sense of impunity. And that makes nuclear weapons real again as well um, because the tonnage in Gaza is equivalent to over a nuclear bomb already. And so we're seeing that if we want to pull the U.S. back from this course of action, which is going up to the brink at this point, um, then we have to build a movement which is anti-war and anti-colonial and understands why nuclear weapons are real for this country and how they relate to our psychology of impunity. Mark Estrin, who is right over here. Mark Estrin is a writer, a cellist, and uh, he uh, has written an amazing book called Insect Dreams, which is about a cockroach that goes to the Manhattan Project and has many experiences. Anyway, so it's kind of a comic book. Is not that, that's funny. not right to say. <laughs> Want to sit down here, I, I or I can I get don't. you a better chair? Here, let me just. Do you want me to stand in the light? Is that the point, Charlie? Yes. Here. Okay. Okay. Today is um, Hiroshima Day. And I don't want to talk about Hiroshima. I want to talk about Nagasaki. Because Nagasaki has very different lessons for us as an ongoing issue. And you may remember that the, what has been called the bomb uh, was not the bomb. It was two bombs. And why were there two bombs? Why was Nagasaki done when we had already done Hiroshima? 
And Hiroshima would have explained, as Harry Truman s said, that the war was over. You can't win, but we still had to go ahead with Nagasaki. Why is that? So the, qu the answer, of course, is, has to do with two bombs. And one of the bombs was a uranium bomb. Um, the uranium bomb was very, very simple physics. Uh, you simply n needed to put enough uranium together to make a um, uh, self-detonating device because neutrons would be uh, emitted from each uranium molecule. And if there are enough in a small space, then you have uh, a chain reaction. And that was understood early on. <clears throat> the person who did that was Leo Szilard. He wrote about <clears throat> he wrote about it. He talked with Einstein about it. He and Einstein wrote a letter together to Roosevelt, started the Manhattan Project to look at this issue of uranium. <clears throat> Along the way, and I think this is a crucial thing, uh, a physicist named Enrico Fermi developed a nuclear reactor in Chicago on the campus um, in 1942, December 2nd, 1942, was the first run of that reactor. It could have run away. There was no prediction, uh, really, of what it was. Everybody just trusted Fermi to say it would be safe. He had a six-inch slide rule, and his six-inch slide rule said this would be OK. <coughs> He was trusted. People came. It's a little bit like the F-35s, because this whole thing was done in the civilian population, uh, no matter what. But um, what's the difference between these two events? The Nagasaki bomb was not a uranium bomb. The Nagasaki bomb was a plutonium bomb Plutonium was coming out of these reactors. What do we do with plutonium? There's more of it. We get as much as we like from the reactors. Let's go with plutonium rather than uranium for ongoing atomic weapon production. That was a decision that was made in the high, by the high ups. So what's the problem? Why do we need to? I mean, we got it. We got it. Uranium, we'll just use them both. You can't use them both. What's the difference? When you shoot a piece of plutonium into a bigger piece of plutonium, this is the way the uh, uranium works. You take a little piece, you shoot it into the big piece, you get critical mass, and things explode. When you try to do that with plutonium, it doesn't work because the plutonium is putting out um, alpha particles, um, radiation, and as it approaches the bigger, the small piece approaches the uh, big piece, it pre-detonates because it's already radiating, coming down the tube. So you cannot use this simple um, rifle, they called it, device, uh, to shoot a piece of plutonium into a bigger piece of plutonium, because you get pre-detonation and fizzling. So an entirely different design had to be invented for the plutonium bombs, um, which involved very complex explosive lenses trying to get uh, all the energy into one place had never been done before. And that was why the plutonium bomb had to be tested in addition to already having done the Hiroshima event. So 
the notion of killing all of those people in Nagasaki was in no way militarily necessary. It was forced by a scientific objective of finding out whether this uh, lens design for a plutonium bomb worked. Now think about that. No military objective. Does this work? 40,000 people killed in Nagasaki to find out the results of that experiment. That's the kind of thinking that is perpetuated in a lot of the scientific work that's going on today. And we have to watch out exactly for that. And Nagasaki is the big lesson. OK, thank you. Thank you for that uh, science report, you might say. Um, so now, um, our last speaker, and then we want to have questions. One second. Yeah? This is such a perfect day and such a perfect presentation. I see this half of this banner coming down because of the tape. So when it does, it's a message that life is imperfect. <laughs> and it's going to be OK. And your voice may not be heard, and that will be imperfect, too. How did you do that? How did you time that? <laughs> OK. So uh, yeah, after this, we are going to be going down to the street and with this banner and talking more about Resolution 77. But right now, um, we have Jim Carrier here, who is uh, perhaps well known in the community as an author and has written about nuclear weapons a lot, and just recently in The Progressive, an article about uh, that, uh, that highlights some of us here in the uh, anti-nuclear movement in Burlington. So uh, please uh, take it away. Let's see. Thank you, Robin. Well, some people think uh, we, we maybe just let it come up a little bit. Do this one here, this one here. There we go, got it, thank you. Um, we, we come from the uh, Welsh rather than the French, so it's, I think we're just playing carrier rather than uh, carrier, although it sounds much more highfalutin to be carrier. Um, I grew up in the Finger Lakes of New York State. I was uh, part of the duck and cover uh, generation. And um, my folks uh, in our farm, the 4-H people, asked whether we would take in refugees from New York City uh, should there be a bomb there and destroy that city. And we, of course, said we would. Uh, it didn't have to, but that was uh, part of the cloud, if you will, that I grew up under. I didn't think much about it later until I went out to the West to work for the Denver Post. And on the 50th anniversary of the bomb, I spent a year and a half doing a whole series on the atomic legacy in the West, which is basically a Western story, from the Navajo mines uh, to all, most of the labs, except for Oak Ridge, um, uh, the test sites, all of that. And of course, that's where the waste is ending up. Um, and I went around to all of these places, went to all the labs. This was in the Clinton era under Hazel O'Leary, the energy secretary. And in 95, they were starting to open up this and tell us things we knew, like where waste was, because they had to clean it up. And then on the anniversary, the 50th anniversary, I went to Hiroshima. And um, I always tell people, if you ever have a chance, you should go. Um, so a couple of years ago, when I wanted to take all that material and put it into a book, um, I uh, began researching uh, for footnotes and that kind of thing and found out that uh, we were making bombs again, <laughs> which uh, in cold, when the, in 95, we were the end of the Cold War. The labs didn't know what to do. Um, we were actually spending more money on cleanup than we were on any kind of bomb making at all. Uh, in 89, uh, the place that made the plutonium pits uh, in outside of Denver, Rocky Flats, was closed uh, by the FBI. And so the labs really were quiet, and we weren't really producing any weapons at all. Um, anyway, um, this led me to now go to some conferences 
and um, pitch to the Progressive magazine a series of articles which I've done. Um, when Biden went to um, Hiroshima for the G7, uh, he said the usual kinds of things. We we're, were committed to getting you know, rid of these weapons, blah, blah, blah. And then that, the month before he had done, you know, created or submitted to Congress the largest uh, budget uh, for nuclear weapons uh, in history. So anyway, uh, this is just a short uh, summary of some of the things that I've discovered and written about. On the table back there is uh, copies of the latest magazine piece I did, um, and you're welcome to take copies uh, along with a copy of this little talk. So let me just begin by saying in October of 45, uh, two months after Hiroshima, uh, Robert Oppenheimer resigned as head of the Manhattan Project, the secret project you know that built the bomb, and he said this in his farewell. You may have heard this. It's a very famous quote. If atomic bombs are to be added as the new weapons in the arsenals of a warring world or to the arsenals of nations preparing for war, then the time will come when mankind will curse the names of Los Alamos and of Hiroshima. Well, sometime in the next few months, and this is the lead of this story that's in this month's of magazine, technicians at Los Alamos using an arc welder will seal together two half domes of plutonium, creating a pit. A seven pound ball the size of a grapefruit that, if tucked into America's newest nuclear warhead and triggered above Times Square, would destroy most of Manhattan and kill 1.2 million people. The bomb is a real weapon uh, of a $1.7 trillion effort to rebuild the U.S. nuclear arsenal. The new pit and hundreds like it um, will be made for the W87-1, a new warhead designed to sit atop the Sentinel, which is a new missile to replace all 400 Minuteman missiles uh, that have been on alert in silos across the Midwest for four decades. Not since the Manhattan Project has so much money and earnest energy being spent to create a weapon of mass destruction. Its yield is around 400 kilotons, which is 20 times larger than the bombs that destroyed both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The government calls it modernization, but it really is a whole new nuclear war machine. 400 ICBMs, cruise missiles, 12 new submarines, 100 new bombers, and modifications to the F-35 fighter jet that will allow it to drop the weapons. Incidentally, as you may know, this coming Monday, the F-35 resolution will be at the city council again, uh, urging the city council to urge our delegation to sign the UN conference, or, or, or sign 77. Um, by the way, I understand that Peter Welch has signed it. He, he, was in, he is a sponsor so um, when he was a congressman. Um, and presumably his position hasn't changed, although I haven't had a chance to. Yeah. Yeah, that's House 77. When he was in the House, he signed it. He's a sponsor. He's a sponsor, original sponsor. There's only 44 people, only 44 members of the Congress have signed on to it. And he's one of them, if, if I, I think correctly. Well, last month, the United States revealed, and this is a piece that's actually out today online for the progressive, that it already has 3,748 nuclear warheads in its military stockpile. These are weapons that are ready to use. An estimated yield that range from eight kilotons for what they call the tactical weapons to more than 300. Roughly half of those, 1,700, 1,770, are armed and deployed on missiles and submarines and bombers, according to the American Federation of American Scientists. 400 of these weapons are installed on land-based intercontinental missiles, 970 are on the submarine missiles, 300 are kept at two Air Force bases in the U.S. There are going to be three more bases that will be added to this. 
and 100 are stored in Europe. These are tactical weapons in three, four, four different countries. Another almost 2,000 warheads are armed and available, and the government describes that group as available for possible deployment within a short time frame. Worldwide, it's estimated that nine countries possess more than 12,000 weapons, warheads, of which 2,000 are mounted on missiles, are on alert, and can be launched on short notice. It was the United States, really, that began this stockpile race. Las Alamos was making more atomic bombs as the first two fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The military wanted them. They had already felt that, that predicted that Russia would soon become a foe and create their own bomb, which they did. By 1946, a year later, the United States had nine bombs and was producing two a month. This is all at Los Alamos. And by 1949, when the Russians exploded their first bomb, the United States had 100 bombs. So that's all I have. I just wanted to say you, we have the, this, this article here. Uh, if you look on the Progressive website, I guess soon today, you'll see the rest of this. So, yeah. We, we can ask now if you want. You have questions or people? Does anybody have any questions of me? I'll sit. Otherwise, I'll sit down. You or Mark or Henry? Oh. Yes, ma'am. Or I can I can re I can repeat it too also. The question is whether or not uh, these power plants, they make it plutonium whether you want it them or not. They are part of the waste, if you will, once the reactor uh, creates. And we don't need, we have 60,000 tons, I think, something like that, of plutonium sitting around uh, that we don't need any more plutonium, but it will, will be made. Plutonium, by the way, there is in the Los Alamos uh, labs that are now making new bombs, they also use plutonium to heat. It's a heat source for all the satellites that go up. That's one of the reasons, one of the things that's used. But um, it will become a waste, a waste issue that will have to be put somewhere. Um, Mm, we don't need any more plutonium. We have 4,000 pits. They're now re the pits that are being made now, new, are actually recycled. We have 4,000 pits that sitting in Pantex that are brought to Los Alamos and put through a, what they call a pyro technique, uh, pyro heating process. All the impurities are taken out of it. That's in that article over there. And uh, it will be... Uh, and they create new ones. They, they make them differently now than they do. Now they make a basically a mold. Um, yeah. Maybe we should move this way. Is that the um, plutonium was a kind of secondary, the power plants were not uh, invented and designed to create plutonium. They were, um, th that plutonium was in there, that there had been previous um, nuclear scientists looking at plutonium, looking at the reactions, uh, the breakdown reactions of uranium and thorium. Uh, we knew that that would possibly be the case. Uh, but the idea of plutonium 
uh, of, of the power plants being an ongoing source of plutonium was a secondary discovery. And, uh, and then people jumped on that. And f bombs went from being uh, uranium planned to being plutonium planned. And the whole plan for the future atomic weapons moved from uranium to plutonium. And so now we have enough plutonium <laughs> to do whatever we want, which unfortunately. Uh, let me just add, because um, um, uh, I could bore you to death with all this detail, but um, um, one of the reasons that they use plutonium is because you can pack so much more power into a 13-pound ball as opposed to uranium, which is very heavy. The difference in sizes between the first two bombs is quite, quite different. Uh, and uh, I interviewed uh, in 95 one of the original Manhattan Project scientists, uh, Carson Mark, who was a uh, Canadian. And he told me that his, his claim to fame was being able to create a one ton bomb in a, a one megaton bomb in one ton, which meant that it could be lofted by a missile. That was one of his claims. Wow. A curious claim. Um, so I would just like to point out that the banner that we had here that says nuclear weapons are illegal. Do you believe that? I mean, we're building them, we have them all the time. What that refers to is that in 1972, we signed on to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And that says that we will not share nuclear weapons with other people, which we have done, and we've given our nuclear weapons to Europe. But it also says we will not build more nuclear weapons. and we are violating that treaty over and over again with what is going on now. After that, and finally uh, making, trying to make it illegal was the treaty prohibiting nuclear weapon, which was passed at the United Nations in 1921, and now, and, and that becomes legal if uh, at least 50 nations uh, not just sign on to it, but ratify it through their parliaments. So 70 nations have ratified the non-proliferation treaty, or rather the treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons. So if you believe that law means anything, that means that we are here in the United States in violation of an important treaty that could bring, you know, an end to our um, our warring parties because the fact that Israel has a has the bomb and other countries have the bomb is one of the basis for the different conflicts, North Korea and so on. So, one question I have for Henry is. Are young people up at UVM and Champlain College or around campus, are they involved? Are, are, are they concerned? Or have you met up with some folks? I would say they are generally pretty focused on what's happening in Gaza and uh, to some degree focused on domestic issues, but I think primarily on <clears throat> what's happening in Gaza. Um, but I think um, Nancy and I and my dad went to the encampment at Dartmouth and um, talked to them about nuclear weapons and how it relates to what we're seeing now. And um, everyone was super interested and and it seemed to kind of be second nature, understandable, like seeing what's happening. It does make it easier to to process um, the the history and the current dangers and the the extreme nature of uh, our ruling classes and security elite and their uh, their philosophies on things. Um, so definitely. The people are open to it, and, and 
I think so, yeah. Great. All right, are there any other questions? Because our, our plan is now to troop outside and drape, drape some of these banners around the entrance of uh, City Hall and read actually the wordage and the, of the um, Resolution 77 that we are putting in front of Becca Ballant. And I thought her assistant was here, but I think he had to leave early. Anyway, um, yes, uh, Jim. Uh, there may be a walk to the um, lake at 6.30 and to meet at, not at Perkins, po po uh, Perkins Pier, but uh, name the destination. Perkins Pier, I think Perkins Pier, okay. 6.30 tonight. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>